in the great, in the great uh, ancient book of wisdom called Ecclesiastes, the writer says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. That word season is important. This transition that we're talking about today um, and that you're interested in began with personally inside of me uh, as a season of change, just this vague sense that a season of change was coming. It started about three years ago or so. Most of you know I came to FBCG in 1986. Uh, I, we, talked about, we talked about this with staff the other day. We have a staff member who was not even born in 1986. <laughs> okay, that was funny to me. Um, <laughs> And I served in that role for about seven and a half years, then made the transition to senior pastor in 1993-94. And Lynn Entz is here. Lynn was chairman during that time when I made that transition. Uh, God has been very gracious to me and to uh, our family, allowing us to grow up here, um, that allowed me to grow up here, not knowing what I was doing when I, when I was, was sort of shoved by God into the role. Um, and our family's been able to grow up here. But I've always believed that and had a sense that um, he had called me as a steward to this ministry. My call to ministry, and most of you don't know this story, was never specific. When I felt God calling me to ministry, it was just to give my life in ministry. It was never to a specific thing, not this role or not that role. He sort of said, I'll clarify that as you go along. So I started as youth pastor, then it became this, and now it's going to become something else as he leads me along. And I've always believed that in the way that leadership was handed to me by people like Bob Gray... Lynn Entz and others, that someday it would be handed over to someone else in God's timing and in God's season in a way that honors him and, and his desires for the church. And over the past couple of years, I began to sense this season of change coming. And looking back, I think the transition started in two ways. First, it probably started when FBCG kind of outgrew my ability to do all the preaching myself. Some of you remember uh, that in the couple of years after we opened West Campus, we went through some dramatic growth. Uh, I would go back and forth and did all the preaching. Remember that? We staggered the services. You'd see me coming in the door and going out of the door before <laughs> the service was over. Uh, and we had one year where we actually added a, a fifth service on Sunday morning. We had an early service at West. So I preached Saturday night and then five times on Sunday morning. So I preached six times every weekend for a whole year. Uh, I remember Joe Stoll, who's a friend of mine, came in to preach one weekend on the theme of missions. And he told me afterward, he said, don't ever ask me to do that again. Uh, <laughs> I'll never, and this is Joe Stoll, he preaches all over the world. He said, I'll never do that again, because it was, it was nerve-wracking for him to get on time and finish and all that. I kind of enjoyed it in some ways, but our, our, our leadership uh, eventually became the decision that I couldn't maintain that pace. It wasn't good for me or the church. Jeff had been here long enough at that time. He had enough time in the pulpit that we saw his, his gifts and, and God's work in his life, and so we made the decision to elevate Jeff, the team teacher, with me over eight years ago now. And so that was when the seeds of this transition first started. Um, then about four years ago, we formed what we called the senior management team. And I moved from kind of leading by myself, which is kind of my bent, my nature, to leading through a team. And that's been a dramatic change and an incredibly positive change for me, for our leadership team, for our church, and for our staff. Um, then about three years ago, um, Lorena and I were talking one day, and it dawned on us that in the summer of 2016, this summer coming up, uh, our family would hit several key milestones. Um, it wasn't a dramatic conversation, but we just could feel it coming. Uh, this is the summer that we will finish our 30th year at FBCG. Uh, the same summer, about a month after that, uh, on August 20th, I'm going to hit my 60th birthday, which means uh, I will have had my 30th, 40th, 50th, and 60th birthday here at FBCG. My 30th happened right after I took the, the job here. The same, about a month after that, our youngest son will head off to college, technically making us empty nesters, although we already have one that's come back to re-nest in our <laughs> basement. So <laughs> and who knows what will happen there. But all that created in us a sense of season change coming, mm -hmm. at least on the family side. Only gradually did that, all that stuff start to come together for me to realize that, God was also whispering about my role here at FBCG. Uh, simply put, the whispering was, it's time to hand it off. It's time to give it away. And I would be asking for a whole year, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean hand it off? What do you mean give it away? I'm not old enough yet. I'm, not, I'm still young. What do you mean? Well, several factors came into play. Uh, first of all, succession planning became important in our thinking. We began to realize that succession planning across uh, the board is vital to the long-term health of any organization and especially the church. So the senior management team began working on succession planning in all our departments with all our key positions, including the role of senior pastor. 
Uh, and during my time here, and during some of your times here, we've seen this done well, and we've seen, also seen it done poorly on occasion or two. And it began to dawn on me that we have an extraordinary opportunity to do it extraordinarily well. Secondly, leadership development became a focus of our staff. Um, something began to resonate in me about the equipping of young leaders in two areas. First of all, our people on our staff right now, you may not know, but we have 55 people or so on our t entire church staff right now, about 32 involved in ministry leadership. Uh, that's a lot of people, a lot of younger people. And so we are focusing more and more on, on what we're calling leadership development, developing skills and, and spiritual strength and appropriate relationships and mentoring so that the younger people in ministry can grow and thrive. And I think we have a responsibility for that. We also started a ministry called Leadership Institute a few years ago. That's our summer internship program. Uh, that last year, I think we had 11 just incredibly bright, young college summer interns in ministry, all considering God's call in their life. I think that's going to grow. And I have kind of a unique growing passion for that. Well, about this same time, same time frame, Jeff was going through his own process, and it started when he shared with me one day that he was being pursued by another church for the role of lead pastor. And throughout the years, I've always told our staff that, you know, if you have an opportunity like that, uh, don't be afraid to let me know. One, so I'm not surprised uh, if that happens. Two is I sort of expect it. When you have gifted, motivated, good people, people are going to be interested in them, and it's going to happen. And so Jeff came to me and told me this was happening. And in the, and in the course of our conversations, um, we spent about a year, uh, maybe or so, talking about this on and off. And there were two questions I ended up asking him, and he'll talk about this from his perspective in just a moment. I said, you need to think about two questions during this process. One, uh, do you believe God's calling you to be a lead pastor in a church or a pastor in a church? And it's really important to know the difference because there's a difference. Secondly, if you believe God's calling you to lead is to be a lead pastor in a smaller, simpler church or in a larger, more complex environment because FBCG is not getting any simpler anytime soon uh, with the direct trajectory of our church. So I left those questions with him. Uh, and now I'm going to let Jeff share his process. Uh, we'll go back to something Brian said. He said, um, when you're pursued, if you have opportunities that come your way, always to let him know. And I think conventional wisdom is you don't do that. You don't talk about opportunities because that might go bad for you in the place you are and what if it, neither one of them works out. I just want to say to all of you in front of Brian, that's very, I, I never felt afraid to talk to Brian about that. I always felt like that's the place I wanted to talk about it. He was always a pastor to me in that and not a, you know, a boss in that way. And that's very rare. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we have here that I was able to do that. Um, and from time to time, churches had uh, on occasion called. It didn't happen like every day or anything, but uh, on occasion that would happen. One church was from Green Bay, and so I just said on principle I could never even entertain the thought. <laughs> just don't call me. <laughs> but, but I always felt very, uh, very quickly, I always felt my spirit, you know, I, I love this church. I love where I am. I love what I'm doing. I have no interest. And so I think prior to this recent situation, I would have answered the first question Brian mentioned, are you called to be a senior leader, is no. I'm where I am. I love what I'm doing. So I was always really easy for me to say, thank you, I'm honored, but no thank you, and move right on. This particular um, church uh, more recently was different for lots of reasons. Um, one, it was different in terms of the opportunity. It wouldn't have required a massive move of my family or a change in culture. It's kind of where FBCG was maybe 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago. I've been here almost 17 years now when I, it, it wasn't small, but it wasn't massive. Um, and I think most, what was different mostly was something was happening in my heart. And that's why it was different. And I, and I think God, without belaboring that whole story, God used that, uh, that process. Because I pulled out of that process, not quite the 11th hour, but late. And I think God used that process to help me answer the first question that Brian mentioned. Are you called to be a senior leader? I think God used that to help me come to the place where I could say yes. Which is a big deal for me. Youth pastor, um, didn't aspire to be anything more than that. Um, I, you know, didn't have big goals. Um, just didn't know. And so um, God used that process and my life here to, to bring me to that place where I could answer that question. I think he has prepared me for that. But I wasn't in a huge hurry. I wanted, to, I wanted to be where he wanted me to be. The second question Brian mentioned, do you believe you're called to lead a smaller organization or a larger, more complex one? That, for me, has to do with how I lead. Uh, I love teams. I love people. I love teams of people. And when you lead a larger organization, you need teams of great people, which we have here and it really charges me up. So 
I think that Brian's two questions were really formative for me at the right time. God used those in the convergence of this opportunity to help me come to a place where I could say, I think God has prepared me and made me to lead, to be a senior leader, and I think uh, I want to do that in an organization where there's a collaborative team environment. Um, I didn't, I never wanted, I want to be clear about this, I, I, I never wanted at all for that to be viewed as like I was leveraging that opportunity to get things going here, never. And in fact, that wasn't on my mind, I never, it wasn't, uh, but, but God working on, his timing seemed to be perfect in this, so. Uh, I've only been in two churches. I've only worked as a pastor in two churches, Willow Creek Community Church many years ago, where I discovered I even had teaching gifts, and uh, God, I mean, I, I remember the first time I ever preached or taught a, a lesson to 1,200 high school students, I was so scared, wanted to fake laryngitis and get out of that so bad, I didn't know. <laughs> uh, but that was where I discovered I even had these gifts, and, and, um, and I discovered what a calling really meant. And then First Baptist, where God developed and honed those gifts and refined that calling, and so I'm very grateful for that. A lot of people in my position have to leave to find other opportunities, and that has never been true about me here. And it's a credit to, to all of you and to God, and so I'm grateful for that. Well, we've had the blessing of um, a really extraordinary continuity in our senior leadership for uh, many years here at FBCG. For example, um, Chris Harris has been with, and had been in the church forever, uh, but with me in leadership for over 20 years now. Roger had been here 20 years uh, when he passed away. Uh, Bruce has been here 19 years uh, with us. Jeff's almost 17 years, uh, and that's extraordinary. And we've, we've benefited from the building of that team and those relationships and all the trust that's there. And you only build that kind of longevity when there's a high level of trust uh, on the team. And I've been a beneficiary of that. And like I said, Jeff's worked with me closely the last eight years or so, planning sermon series and, and, and uh, learning how to do that. We worked together and closely in all aspects of leadership during those years. And I have come to believe, um, one of the things that started, we never talked about his future role here while he was going through that process. But it started me thinking. I thought, I thought to myself, th this is really only the first of many that are going to happen for Jeff. And if he goes, I was faced this, this void of what am I going to do next? How am I going to find the next Jeff? He's been here long enough now. I'm used to him. I know him. I trust him. Finding some and building, I, it was exhausting to think about. Actually, it was. And so that's what got me thinking about trajectories and season of change. And all that started to come together. And that's why eventually, to make a long story short, I recommended to the, uh, the, the executive council that Jeff be brought forward as the intended candidate as the next senior pastor in a transition succession plan. I shared my thoughts with Doug Kite shortly after jo Doug joined our team just about three years ago. And Doug's expertise is, is uh, personnel, succession planning, and that sort of thing. So he began to work on a process. Over about a year, we put together a process um, uh, that, uh, uh, that we eventually took to the executive council. We even took a trip down to Little Rock, Arkansas to spend a day with a pastor down there that we all respected who'd gone through a transition himself just to learn what we could learn from him. And so about two years ago, I introduced the idea of this succession plan to the executive council, and they began to vet it and think about it and pray about it. We began to talk about it. To make a long story short, uh, the EC eventually approved unanimously uh, a, a transition plan. And we have an agreement pending, obviously, a vote of the FBCG membership in August. Um, and we'll give you a, s a chance to ask some questions about that whole process in just a couple of minutes. But two of the questions I want to anticipate ahead of time and talk about them first. One of them is, so what are you going to do? Mean, meaning me. What's your next role going to be? Uh, and so let me talk about that just for a second. Uh, first of all, I want to make it clear that I'm, I'm not retiring a whole bunch of people have come up and said, hey, congratulations. I say, on what? They say, well, on your, on your, uh, you know, you, and they think, they say the word retirement, and I just start to shudder. No, 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 that, that word's not in there anywhere. We go reread that letter. I'm not retiring. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not tired. I'm not burned out. Uh, I, I love what I do. I love the church. Uh, I, I simply have come to believe that it's a season change, that there's a season for change. Uh, my desire, and the EC has uh, agreed with this, is to continue, continue as a full-time pastor here at FBCG for at least five more years. Maybe longer, if God leads, but at least five more years full-time, but in a different capacity. My role will be called something like, haven't quite finalized it yet, but Pastor of Leadership and Development here at FBCG. And Jeff would become, pending approval, Senior Pastor of FBCG. Um, we envision this role as enabling me to uh, continue to preach and teach and use my strongest gifts, as well as investing my time and experience and continuing to build the impact of FPCG 
in our community and the world. My role will include the following, preaching and teaching, just like I've always done, just like I'm doing now. Uh, secondly, leadership development. Talked a little bit about that already. I have a kind of a growing passion for identifying and, and uh, building young leaders. Uh, I think that's part of what the Lord was saying when he said, you know, you've got to learn to give it away. You've got to learn to give away what you've learned, give away uh, to younger people, uh, both on our, leader, on our FBCG staff and in the Leadership Institute. Uh, mentoring our younger pastors as that opportunity becomes available. So leadership development. And thirdly, a unique area that we're just sim simply calling right now organizational development. Uh, I believe, I'll talk about this just for a minute, but I won't spend too much time on it because it's brand new. Uh, I believe for a long time that God has called FBCG to extraordinary local and global impact. I think that's why I ticked off all those things at the beginning of the meeting today. God is doing some things through our church. Uh, he's doing some new things through our church, and there's more things to come. Uh, I believe we're poised for a season of impact right now. Uh, Jeff and I, along with the entire senior management team, which is myself, Jeff, Bruce McAvoy, and Doug Kite, and the executive council, believe that part of that impact is going to be leadership development. Part of it's going to be uh, our local and global partners through Serve the World. Uh, part of it's going to be expanding our vision for reaching the neighborhoods of Kane County, this, this tri-city region. And part of it, I believe, is going to be deepening and strengthening our reservoir of resources. I've long believed that a church like FBCG should have, for lack of a better word, a kind of endowment for ministry, like a college or university does. That is a way to gather resources outside of our annual operating budget that will allow the church to take, to take advantage of opportunities that come along for impact that we've not yet imagined. Uh, and I won't go into too much detail on that, but part of what we'll put together and we're working on right now is to build a relationship with a firm that can create a foundation or an endowment to allow um, a legacy generosity to gather so that we have resources to react when we have opportunities for impact. Let's say, for example, Shep I mentioned Shepherd's Heart. Shepherd's Heart is bursting the seams already in the new space that we built downstairs after two years. The Northern Illinois Food Bank has told us we are the largest distribution point in Kane County for what they do, and they would give us giant freezers if we had space to put them because they want to use our ministry for more than that. We're serving eight, four, 600 to 1,000 individuals a month. We don't have that space. But what if a building became available to us two months from now, somewhere that's perfect for us, how would we secure that building? Right now, we would have no way to do that because we don't have a reservoir of resources that allows us to move that quickly. We'd have to have a whole series of meetings, a fundraising campaign, and that takes time. We'd lose the opportunity. So that's among the things I would have in mind, and I would put, be a, play a key role in developing the relationships, casting the vision, and uh, engaging people in this unique opportunity for legacy generosity, if that makes sense. And then there will be other passions and opportunities as well. Obviously, the team men's ministry, um, couples events, uh, serve the world opportunities. I'm going to China this fall to teach younger pastors there with a, one of our ministry partners. Uh, and all those things will come alongside that. But those are the three main areas, and we'll probably add to that as we go forward. Now, in case you're wondering, my wife's role as Director of Women's Ministries is not changing. She's not on my same time plan. Uh, she's younger than I am. Okay. Um, and <laughs> I know some people on Facebook ask me, that they say, I didn't know you had a daughter. <laughs> That's not very funny, actually. <laughs> Uh, but she's working on her own succession plan. She's responsible for that. Women's ministry is working on their process going forward. And eventually that time will come uh, for her as well, and she'll hand off ministry. Uh, as I mentioned, the EC has created a transition agreement. Uh, Ken can speak to that later if you have questions about it. But in the agreement, the formal transition would take place pending approval of the congregation in August on September 1st, 2016. Uh, that was when the formal handoff will take place. Titles will change, will change seats. However, there's already been informal processes in place because you don't just do that all at once and there will continue to be gradual processes after that watershed date but that's what the transition agreement says the last question i want to anticipate before we go to your questions would be so what's going to change at fbcg if we go through with this what's going to change the first thing i would say is that outwardly uh not much at all will change my guess is that there will, there will be people not the ones in this room who you're the ones in this room paying closest attention but the other 3,000 people who maybe don't pay as close attention will be going, what, what happened? I thought there was going to change. I, still, he's still, what, I, didn't, I thought everything was going to change. Well, because they're still going to see me preaching and teaching in my current role. And not much will change publicly for a, for a while, which is one of the great blessings of a planned out succession plan. It protects the church from trauma and from confusion. 
The, tra the, the train will keep going right down the track that God's called us on. What will change mostly is internally with staff leadership. Uh, Jeff will take leadership of our ministry staff. He'll take the leadership of our senior management team, and he'll become the voting member of the executive council. Uh, I will, I will st still attend some meetings, some meetings I won't attend anymore, just because he needs to be in that seat, and people can't be looking to me when he, they should be looking to him. So internally, those changes will happen the quickest. Externally, publicly, there won't be much feel of change really at all. Uh, but there will be a season of change internally. So we've put that out to, there to you. You may have a thousand questions. You may have no questions. But before we move on to anything else we want to share today, I want to give you a chance just to ask questions of myself, of Jeff, of Ken, of our EC, anything you want to ask. So the floor is yours. There's a mic right there, or you can stand up and just shout out your question. Yes? I was just wondering if you will be doing more traveling. Uh, you know, I don't know that. I think in, initially I think I would anticipate I'll probably tra feel, be a little freer to travel, for example, first of all, with Serve the World, with Bruce's area of ministry. Uh, that is, is very exciting to me. I, 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 um, I think I can see myself visiting a partner or being involved, like, like China has asked me to come and teach young pastors, work in my expertise, but that, that would be really fun to do, uh, maybe once a year, a little freer than I am now to do that. Uh, other than that, I don't really know. I think that's open as far as what God leads us to. But I think, you know, to, again, to me, it's, it's the, the, and I'm still clarifying some of this in my side myself, but when the Lord whispered, was whispering to me, it's time to give it away, to me that means, uh, part of what it means is share it with younger people so that you help them learn and grow. The same way people helped you learn and grow, hand it off, help them learn and grow. In other words, he's saying, you know a lot more than you think you do. Pass it on. Yep. Team. Thank you, Jeff, for asking that. Actually, uh, team will stay in my uh, leadership bucket for at least the next couple of years. See, if I, if Jeff and I have talked about this. Jeff, uh, we're, we're looking at um, on, um, the next couple of years and what we want to do with men's ministry. Team has is, is, is been a really strong, powerful thing now for 17 years. I'm going to keep doing it. Um, there's another ministry happening in church with men that we, Jeff and I are talking about a way to blend those and present several tiers of options for men and share it together. Because eventually I need to hand that off to somebody else too. It's not going to happen in the next few years, but eventually I'll need to hand that off. But right now there's not a plan to do that. But I'll, so I'll still lead team. Um, maybe a, there may be some guest speakers now and then if I'm traveling, but I'll still be do, doing team. As long as you're there. You promise to be there? Okay. <laughs> I've been in several transitions in my life in business, and uh, when you have the heir apparent there, uh, it has always worked best <clears throat> to have him actually assume the responsibilities and the duties of the senior uh, for almost six months before he actually takes over. So the senior pastor still remains the one in authority and, and can then allow you all the freedom you need, but still have the authority to say, wait, I just don't think we should go that way. Mm -hmm. So when are you going to actually take over the day-to-day -day senior pastor duties prior to the <coughs> vote in August? Thanks. Do you want me to respond to that? Like Let me can. start, and then you yeah. can jump in. It's a great question. And we, we, we've uh, kind of wrestled with that question, and I referred to it kind of obliquely in my opening comments in that that. The transition of leadership is a process as well as a point in time. Uh, Jeff and I, in anticipating this summer, started over a year ago with some small things, handing off leadership of our worship teams, for example. I haven't been to a worship leadership meeting in a year and a half now. And that was odd because I was at every one for 20 years. Uh, and we wanted to see that from two sides. I wanted to see if I could let go of it and trust him. And he, he needed to see if he could do it and if he could trust me to stay out of, stay out of it. And so we did that as kind of a little, exp and we, 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 could do, <laughs> we did that as a little bit of an, of an experiment, uh, but that was a part of the process. And we anticipate, even though there's a point in time coming September 1st, 2016, pending approval of the membership of this church, uh, that there'll be a point in time, but there'll be a, a, a period of time after that where I, even though Jeff assumes the responsibilities formally, he will still come to me with questions, which he does now. What, the way we work, we've built a friendship of trust over the years. And 
I think you can feel that. Uh, because if Jeff were not the one here, I wouldn't be making this right now. I wouldn't. And I say that clearly. He's the reason, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why I, why I think the Lord led me here. And, and we have this trust because I think he trusts that even though I'm going to stay around, I'm not going to butt into his business. I think he can trust that. I also know that he can come to me with any question and I can tell him the truth what I think. And that's what, what, we're, that's what the relationship we're forging. So I become sort of his safety net for leadership, but he's going to have the chair. He's going to have the baton. So to answer Lynn's question, we've already started some of that, but we want to be careful not to get too far ahead of the game because we know we respect the membership and the decision the membership has to make in August. Yeah, we have to do all this work. We're presenting to you like it's a done deal. We understand that it's not. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to get too far over our skis before that vote happens. You get to ask all the questions you need to ask, if that makes sense. In fact, Lynn, uh, Brian has the times uh, given away leadership, senior leadership roles to me, and I've been nervous about that because I don't want to be presumptuous. The way it isn't a done deal. Our church does have to vote on this. He is the senior pastor. Uh, and so, but uh, I, he and the executive council have been pushing that more and more to, for a gradual handoff. And, you know, uh, going back to something Brian said, uh, when, we, when we first started preaching together, it was like this. Uh, Brian mentioned our relationship. Because I, I had a friend, I'll come back to that. This will make sense in a minute. Let me talk about <laughs> I have a friend who said, you're going to do what? You're going to be a senior pastor? And that guy's sticking around? That'll never work. He doesn't know, you know. He's, a, he's in ministry. He's like, that just doesn't work in business. It doesn't work. I'm like, you don't understand the opportunity that we have and the relationship that we have. And he said, well, then you're, a, you're in rare company. You've got a very special situation. And I think he's right. When we first started preaching, when Brian first asked me to start preaching, it was like this. Here's the text. Here's the outline. Here's what you're preaching. You know, okay. The outline was to mainly keep him from going for an hour. That was the, that was the main reason for that. <laughs> it's true so confining and then uh, then it was like more like well here's the text and the basic idea but you know m develop your own outline and then it was well you know we work together on the text and the main ideas and the last couple of years it's been very collaborative and so much fun for me and for us I think for us to work together on where do we think this is going what do we think God wants to say to our people and to flesh it out together and I, I've loved that so that's just an example of how even in the preaching area he's been handing handing it off we've been and I want to say publicly I am very very glad Brian is not retiring uh, I would, uh, I'm not sure how I'd feel if he, if he was just gone. I'm thrilled about the role that he's t told you just a little bit about. I think it's mission critical for our church uh, for the future. And I'm glad I, I, that he'll be around and, and a vital voice in, in, in my leadership and to our church as well. So, I really applaud you on planning for the leadership transition. I have one question relating to Jeff's role. My impression is he has a full bucket now. You're adding to it what is going out of the bucket. Oh, nothing. There's a hole in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> it just leaks everywhere. <laughs> uh, that, no, go ahead. Right. No, you go ahead. Uh, yeah, jump in where I fall yes, short. But um, that actually gets us a little bit into the, the next question. Um, that is, uh, when, when these two pieces of the puzzle move a little bit, it creates other necessary movement in our staff team and our leadership team. And we started thinking about that uh, a year or so ago. Uh, okay, then what's, what are we gonna do next? What, how, how, how do we fill in here? What comes here? What, who fills that seat? Who fills this chair? And that sort of thing. And uh, let me just talk, I, I won't go into depth on this right now because we're putting together the whole plan. It's a 12 to 24 month staffing plan to touch all these things. Obviously you can't, we can't do all of it at once because it's a huge number uh, to fit into our budget. So we stagger it out over time. But w one of the changes that's happening um, this, this, this uh, summer as we head into this next season uh, does, is not related to this transition. It's related to what's happening in our church. Uh, Pastor Bruce McAvoy has been here for 19 years or so. And for the last, how many years has it been since you've worn out these hats? Six or seven? Eight more than that? Six or seven years he's worn both the hat of pastor of family, fa pastor of family and serving. So he's really led two really large departments, and as, as the service side, Serve the World, local serving, has grown in staffing and dollars raised and all that, Bruce has done an extraordinary job spinning an extraordinary number of plates, and it's all behind the scenes, because you don't see him up front here, it's all behind the scenes. But uh, Bruce has decided and agreed with our looking at the whole thing to move full-time into uh, the serving, mission, serve the world arm of our church's impact. We haven't come up with a title yet, but it'll be something like Pastor of Impact Ministries. 
And so that whole division, from our global, uh, our global partners to our local partners to our staff in that area Shepherd's to serve heart. the world, Shepherd's Heart, Shepherd's heart to our global, uh, what we call global staff, all the missionaries that are out there serving. You know, we have almost 30 missionaries who grew up here who are serving around the world. Bruce keeps in contact with all of them. So that will become his role. And so that creates the next domino, which is we need a leader for family, student, and children's ministries. And uh, we are going to move Sterling Moore from his current role as Trek High School pastor into that role. And then that creates a hole behind Sterling to lead Trek High School. And we've made an offer to a, a young man we've known for three or four years, which he just recently accepted. He'll join us in May to join our team as a co-director of Trek High School Ministries. So we're, those are the three buckets, three seats we're filling first that we can handle in our budgeting and all that. Now we're going to look at our whole staff as well. We have a lot of staff, a lot of ministry departments to be aware of and to make sure we take care of going forward, make sure the ministries can thrive, and we're doing that. But those are the things that move. In terms of Jeff's role, we aren't going to replace immediately Jeff as pastor of, uh, of adult discipleship. The reason is he's got some very competent people it's working in his department. Hmm? It's become irreplaceable. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that too. Uh, he's got some competent people in there, and those... those um, we're going to allow that to, to go forward for a, for a year or so. Um, we are going to look to bring administrative support around Jeff's role. We, he and I lead a little bit differently that way. Uh, that will be something that he needs. But eventually we will hire. Eventually we will hire someone in that role. But we want to pause for a while because there are some visionary things we're going to be talking about over the next couple of months that will tell us what kind of person we're going to look to fill that role. So we're not going to fill it immediately. We're going to fill it eventually. So the bucket is going to be large. He's, he has people around him, a staff around him to help carry those, bu those pieces uh, for the next year or so, and then we'll look to fill that, if that makes sense. I think I know where your question is coming from, Lee, and I appreciate you asking that I do. I would put it this way. While we have some immediate things we're doing uh, with Sterling and Bruce, and we have a gradual plan behind me, and I, I feel very good about it. You can always come back and ask a question about that transition plan thing and even by at the next church family meeting. Let me transition a little bit in here just to watch our time. I talked just a bit about some staffing dominoes that will, that will move, and there are some more coming over, again, over a 12 to 24-month period. But let me talk, just initiate the idea of FPCG's vision for the future. We're not going to go deep into this now, but we're going to tease you a bit and set something up for further conversation in the next couple of months. Uh, you remember Growing to Serve. Our... Um, Initiative began a couple of years ago to, um, to have greater ministry impact, and we had several priorities in the Growing to Serve campaign. One was to retire the existing debt at that time, which we did. The other was to renovate this campus, which we did, mostly in the lower, uh, lower level. And third phase was, building, was, was, was adding space to the West Campus, sort of in a phase one North edition, which we did, upstairs and downstairs, buddy break, break rooms, and so forth. And there was a final phase that we put on hold because of the amount of funds we raised. Uh, we didn't want to take on debt. So we just put a hold on it. You, and if you've been at West Campus, you still see the painting on the sidewalk out there. Someday it's going to come out to here. Well, we began to review that uh, a number of months ago. Is it when, what are we going to do next? When's the time? Is it the right time? Is it what we want to do? Because one of the things you need to know about our leadership, and this started way back with, uh, in the previous um, uh, executive councils we've had, we always review our plans. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned in 2008, uh, we had plans on the table to build a 2,000-seat sanctuary at the West Campus. Had we proceeded with that, we'd be sitting in a, in a sea of debt right now, a sea of debt. And a lot of churches did that. They built at the wrong time because when, when, the, when the economy went south in 2008, we put everything on hold. And it was during that period of time we became convinced as leadership that God wanted us to stay two campuses for whatever time he had us for. And that's where we are now. We started looking at smaller venues for worship like this room and other places. And what's interesting is across the country, that's what's happened. Nobody's building those giant boxes anymore. They're too expensive. And you use them once a, once a week. You need to build other kinds of space. You need to keep your church out of uh, crippling debt and all those sorts of things. So we were reviewing what's next. Or is this the right thing to take over? During that uh, next, right thing to do next. During that same time, we were approached by uh, actually two churches in our region. One in our local region 
seeking out us for the possibility of some sort of merger. It was a church that was struggling mightily, and they were coming to us uh, for some sort of help. And this initiated the process for us that made us go, hmm, we need to really rethink what we're doing here at West Campus and why and what God has for us. I'll let Jeff talk a little bit about that yeah. process then. Just, just yeah. bird's eye view. So when, when, the, when the letter went out from Brian uh, last summer uh, that, that, uh, in the executive council about the transition, and people began to hear about this, they would invariably ask me, well, what's your vision for our church? And I didn't know how to answer that other than to say, mm, more of the same? I like what we're doing. I wasn't clear. If I had something different, I didn't know. And, and sometimes, um, if I'm honest, I think I felt insecure about that. Like, maybe I should have some grand, different vision. Um, when this church that approached us asked this question, I think all of us on the senior management team initially thought, we don't really see that. We don't have a plan to become like a, a massive campusing thing all over the Chicagoland area. That's not us. We don't know. And so we said no. Right? I mean, Brian. Um, then we went away to Lake Geneva, the four, the four of us, to pray and plan is, for some other things. This is last things. summer. Last summer. Summer of 2015. Sorry. To pray and plan for some other things. And I, independently, we each said, you know what? Maybe God is doing something that we should pay attention to that we don't yet see. Maybe there's something in this request that we don't yet see. We should revisit it. But we're not smart enough to figure it out on our own. And so we brought in a consultant. Uh, his name is Jim Tomberlin. He's sort of the multi-site church expert in the country, uh, but I, I knew of him. And we just brought him in to observe our church and ask us questions and lead us through a process. After the Saturday night service, we're out to dinner. And uh, uh, Brian and Doug and Jim and Tomberlin and I, and just in the course of conversation, he used a phrase, neighborhood church. He said, perhaps you should see yourselves as more of a neighborhood church model. And we just were eating. Something in my spirit stirred when he said that, neighborhood church. I went, oh, what is that? I texted Brian on the way home. I stayed up half the night thinking about it. I don't, can't tell you in detail what that means right now, but here's the thing. Do we really expect more and more people to drive from farther and farther away to a larger and larger box at the West or East Campus? Is that really the way we're going to make the greatest impact? I think perhaps no. Perhaps God is calling us, you know, you, 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 many of you drive from 10, 15 minutes out, right? You drive through neighborhoods, but you don't know anybody there. To this church, you know a few people here, you go back to your neighborhood, you drive in your garage, you close the door, you go in your backyard, which is fenced, you don't see your neighbor. I think every Christian, every Christ follower should be a great gift to their street and neighborhood, and every church should be a gift to its neighborhood and community. And I think we are, as a church, growing in that way. We already have two neighborhood communities. In a way, we already are that, sort of accidentally, you know. Perhaps God is calling us to think about the long-term vision is not build a massive thing, but reproduce the healthy, exciting, gospel-driven DNA of our church in neighborhood communities, neighborhood churches. I don't mean a house church. I mean churches, congregations. Um, anyway, I'm sure that many of you are going, huh? And some of you are going, whoa. And some of you are going, yes. But either way, we can talk a lot more about that uh, in, in the weeks to come because and, it, it's the beginning of a vision. Yeah, the point there is that we, we were, uh, that's pushed us to, re, to just make sure we rethink and reconsider what we originally assumed that we would do. Mm -hmm. And we have a track record of doing that over the last 20 years or so. Just because we came up with a plan five years ago doesn't mean it's still exactly the plan we right. should follow especially when that amount of money and that amount of, um, of uh, communication and development is, 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 is being asked for. We want to make sure we're wise with, as stewards of resources, both human capital and financial capital, and make sure that, 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 that it's the impact that the God wants us to have at this point in time. So all to say to you right now is that we are in the process of reconsidering that. And as each of these church family meetings goes forward, we're going to give you more information as we know it about, about what we think might or might not be coming in that area. Okay, if that makes sense. So any more questions you have about any of those things? Okay, so there you go. we go. Yes, yes, there we go. So there's the teacher for the next three meetings. Okay. Um, you know, what you're hearing today is, uh, you know, from past town halls, we'd like to give you an update on what's going on in the church. Uh, certainly, uh, an update on the transition. Um, I, I, you're, you're getting the one-hour story, uh, but there have been countless meetings, uh, hours and hours of prayer, um, and many, many discussions behind this uh, to prepare for not only today, but uh, what's coming over the next several months. And so it's imperative that you join us. It's imperative that you come to these meetings and, and really find yourself informed. It's also imperative that you pray. 
Uh, we, are, we are seeing some amazing things going on at this church. Uh, we feel that God uh, has got a hold of us, and we want to make sure that we're not missing the direction he's giving. I hope what you heard today and saw today, not only the excitement in these two individuals, but uh, that they are making sure that, and trying their very hardest to listen, to, to make sure that they are seeking out and finding what God has in store for this church, and for them individually in, in their roles in this church. Uh, it has been a pleasure for me, and I know for the rest of the executive council, to watch this, to be a part of this. Um, I have had individuals come up to me and say, you know, how, how's the transition going? I said, well, you know, we've, we've gone through this part, we're preparing for that. Oh, I, I thought it was already done. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> we, we still have a vote. But we are working to prepare. We are uh, taking some steps uh, to look at how things would transpire uh, after that August vote. Um, and I think uh, we have a very unique, a very unique situation. Uh, Lynn, you asked a question about the six months. Well, a lot of times it's because at the end of that six months, the senior pastor's gone. And that's not going to happen here. We have a very unique situation. And I think without any question in my mind, a very unique blessing that God has afforded us uh, to do this transition in the way we're able to do it also because of what he's putting before us in terms of, of the vision he has for this church. So I hope that you will pray. I hope you will take some time to ask questions. I hope you will reach out to Brian, uh, to Jeff, to myself, Bruce, Tony, others. Uh, as they said, they've already had a lot of these conversations with the staff, so they should be prepared, willing, excited, wanting to talk to you. Um, as uh, any member of the EC would, would love to do that as well. We want you to be engaged, and we look forward to seeing you in the next three family meetings. So, very much appreciate that. Can I, can I add something about, sure. can I encourage you to pray? If you, let me give you some specific, invite you to pray along three specific lines, which we're already praying. Um, these are my prayers of my heart and of our staff and team. Uh, first, uh, pray for unity. Anytime, I, th I think we have that in spades here, and God has blessed us as a church. I love our, the spirit of our church. But anytime there's change, it's an opportunity for the enemy, enemy to sow seeds of disunity. And so just pray for that God would not allow that to happen. Second, pray for clarity. Clarity for us and for all of us to see clearly where he's leading us. And then last, uh, I would ask you to pray for courage, that we have courage as a church family to follow, wh wherever that is. So unity, clarity, and courage. And, and of course, whatever else you want to pray for, but those three things would be great.